always always be clapping. Oh my god. Like your clap. Hey y'all. Hat. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Hi guys. Welcome back. To Welcome to the show. The she eyes. hates it every time I say that. Every time I say that. Whatever. I say it mostly just to get a reaction out of you. Now. I know. I know. That's what is your issue? You, you don't reaction. like it to be it's a show. It's so corny. It's like, a show. I'm welcoming them to it. Okay, welcome to the show. Yeah, all right. That's what I said. Anyways, welcome how, to the show. Everybody. How is everybody doing? What We're is back. the four one one? It's been a while. <laughs> when was the last one? Oh, a year ago? No, Austin. If we started the podcast a year ago, and the last one was like in December, was it either right after I gave birth or no, right, right before? Four. Right before. Are you sure? We filmed yeah. one afterwards to talk about it, but we never put it out. We'll put it up. Well, that's going to be on Patreon. Really? No, that's going to be on my main channel, I think. Okay. Because it's fine. just my birthing story, mostly. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see what or we, we do can with put, it. Or we can put just clips of it up. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Anyways, how's everybody doing? Um, It's been a while. It has. This is, this is our first podcast of the year, that means. First podcast of the year. No. Right? You said the last one was December. I don't know when the last one was. I don't... Maybe it was January, to be honest. We think it was December. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But it's officially a year since we started. Happy birthday. <laughs> and Happy anniversary, baby. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been so long. I needed... um. What do you call it? Maternity we leave. We took a maternity leave, all right? We just had a baby. She had a baby. It's isn't it so weird when guys are like, "We had a baby." <laughs> well, you just did. I that. just accidentally did that, but people do that on purpose, like they're trying to take some kind of credit for it as the dude. You take credit. You just you had try a baby. To take credit for it all the time. Well, I made the baby, but you had the baby. Anyways. Anyways. But she just had a baby. We took a maternity leave. <laughs> Technically, not Calm just. Down. Because he's seven months old now. Oh, so we had a, so you had a seven month maternity leave. Is that ridiculous? That's not no, ridiculous. No, I think that's very normal, especially that's in other countries. That's what everyone complains about in Europe and shit. They have like a year maternity leave or something. No, so, people complain about it here that they don't. Yeah, exactly. So how is anyone going to give us a hard time for not making a podcast? I'm sorry, for but six months. We're back and we're better than ever because well, let's recap. New and improved. Yes, new and improved. <laughs> one i'm not pregnant anymore so i'm hopefully not going to be emotional but also it's there's the been week, a lot of healing it's the week before my period so i'm like oh, oh god <laughs> danger honestly earlier today i was feeling some type of way and i was like oh my god and we're gonna film a podcast and just gonna it's not. oh really what were you feeling earlier like angry and um emotional and um you know what's so scary to me not is feeling good so often i just I'm completely oblivious. Like, I have no clue, and then I just get hit over the head. Surprise, out of nowhere, motherfucker. Just boom. <laughs> like, she's furious. And I'm just like, la da 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 Life is great. Boom. Like... Rest in peace. <laughs> Anyways, back to um, drink of the day. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> Can I censor that? Anyways... Um, it looks like wine. It's not wine. It honestly, I thought it, and it kind of tastes like wine, but. It's wine. Suck it. <laughs> I'm battling a UTI. That's sad. And I, at the beginning of a UTI, I should say. So I'm hella drinking real cranberry juice, like the bitter kind, like the no sugar, no cocktail. It like kicks you in the face every time you take a real. drink. Real. So if I go like, in your, it's not alcohol, but it, it might as well be because at this point it tastes so bitter like it. But I really love cranberry juice. so. But not that hardcore kind usually, right? I do, but it's Oh, you like, like that one even? It's bitter. Yeah, it's you intense. You try it. Yeah, let me try it. Mm. It's going to be so much more bitter because I just drank yeah, something Monsters. It's super, super sweet. sweet. Okay, so slight recap. It's intense, but it's not bad. I always thought that's what wine was going to taste like. It's pretty delicious, but it's just intense. But it's not what wine tastes like, unfortunately. How would you know, Nero? I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. So a year ago when we started the podcast, I think we should do that recap. Okay, we're Real doing quick. a year in review recap. Mm-hmm. 
2020 to 2021. Right. Where do you want to start? Um, I got pregnant at what I thought was a terrible time. It was in, in the middle of the apocalypse, right? In the middle of the pandemic. Beginning, actually. Nero was in Morocco. Mm-hmm. And right before you left, like the week before you left, yeah, your dad. My parents oh my were freaking out. They're like, there's this thing called coronavirus. I don't think she should go. It's very dangerous. Why expose yourself to no, that? I remember and I had never even head. heard of it. And have you heard of it at that point? Yeah, because I'm like a news person. You're not. And yeah, they see, are too. I never even heard of it. So like they're, um, they were able to infect me with the fear of it. You they know, did? I, yeah, because do you remember? I was like, maybe you shouldn't go. Like, and I was looking at you like, go and you were like, yeah, whatever. rocks, yeah. honey bun. I respect that. <laughs> um, and I still believe that. And then when you guys were on your way back, where did you go through to Paris then on no, the way back? No, we went through Spain. And then we... And they started locking shit down. And then Trump was like... Like, like U.S. citizens. We're, we're stopping flights coming in and everything, you know? Yeah. And so I, I was like, yo... Yeah. I might not ever see you again. Like, you you literally you. were Had treating me like that it was, too. It was nice. It was good while it lasted. <laughs> I like like I legit thought like shit could happen. You for know for sure. And like, now shit I feel gets like real sometimes. It's... Not for Americans really, but like all over the world. You know, like I feel some like war or something starts and like shit just uh, you never see your family again or something. Yeah, and I feel like that's more realistic ever. Like it feels like that really could happen now more than ever. To me. I think that's one of the things, the takeaway things from the whole thing. Pandemic. Yeah, because with the, for Americans, yeah, we were we've so... just had stability our entire lives. And yeah. We never thought some shit like that could ever really actually happen to us. Like that's something that happens over there mm-hmm. in the third world. And I think this made, but you know what? We were just talking about the other day, like when it first happened, everyone was like freaking out and buying canned foods and there was no food in the shops and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, this was before, like, people were really freaking about freaking out about this new Delta variant or whatever the fuck. But we, I was just thinking, like, we were going to the grocery store, and I was just like, whatever happened to that? Like, people just forgot to, like, be Stock freaking up? out about food supplies no, and shit. No, I don't think you understand. I think the people that, like, 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 really realize how that anything can happen now, I think there's still stock. Like, I think they're still buying shit like that. Well, like, when it first happened, I was buying canned food every time I went to the store, and I just stopped. Like, I just, life went back to normal, pretty much, and so then you just forget so, it's crazy how quickly shit can just go back to normal. Normal. And then you, like, stop, like, stop being that vigilant and, like, remembering that you need to be prepared and shit. Mm. At least it is for me, and, like, all the cans are still uh, on the grocery store shelves but so with, apparently for most people too yeah but like you were the one of the people that never stopped work like you didn't experience quarantine really except for the yeah thank god except for the um the traffic <laughs> like the lack of traffic yeah the lack of traffic. i feel like lovely. that was the closest thing for you to experience well, no the, the closest right? thing for me that the biggest thing i experienced was just ha- like having to wear a mask everywhere and seeing everyone in masks. Just like how quickly it became normal for everyone to be wearing masks. Which I'm not mad at because honestly... I'm I'll mad be, at it. Well, here, I'm not mad at because I like the incognito-ness of it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's why I've always, like, kind of like the club, you know? It's right. Like, incognito. There's something mysterious about it. Well, my whole thing was, like, the pandemic and everyone being masked up was a great time for ugly people and for people with ninja fetishes like it was the greatest time ever for those people okay for everyone else kind of inconvenient sucky oh my goodness so yeah so that happened and then um, and then i i predicted a baby boom following the pandemic you did i did you did and sometimes you gotta make your own predictions come true you did so I got back, and then I got pregnant, literally, boom, like, boom. the week I got back. Or the week, yeah, it was, like, the week after I got back, I think. Anyways, so I feel like um, during that time, Asif and I were not doing well. <laughs> I feel like we had not been doing well for... A while, but I feel like it, while, that had like, almost gone to, like... 
That was almost a breaking peak point of not. Yeah. Because I think if you had continued on the way you were going as far as like giving everyone else your time and not me, I, th- I don't know. Like I really like, I felt like I was hitting my breaking point. See, one, this is another example of what I was just talking about, being completely oblivious, going about my life, like, la-da-da-da-da. Oh, 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 also. Like, I'm just... Because the main... Oh, I dyed my hair blonde, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's all grown out now. It was completely <laughs> dyed blonde. Platinum. And now it's, like, now it's mostly grown out. I really We're about like... to dye it again, I think. Yeah, but I really like the tip look. Oh, uh, yeah? hmm So why do you keep pestering me about dyeing it again, then? I don't know, because I'm afraid it's going to go away. I don't know. But, like, there's more. I, I like it like this, too. I do like it like this. When it was just all blonde, it was, like, a little too much, I feel like. Like, this way you get contrast with it. For sure. Um, <laughs> you look good, Asif. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, oh, yeah, so. What were we talking about? Relationship oh, wasn't doing you were well. about to leave me? I was about to leave you. That's sad. Just kidding. Not leave you, but, like, literally, Kill like. Kill me. Okay, so the problem with that... Hey, hey, hey. The problem with him not knowing is because Keep your we hands never to yourself. Communi- Don't just be, you can't just be grabbing people's mics like that. Jesus, Austin. Awesome. That's sexual harassment. Can you, you are so annoying. Can you... Okay, we're good. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so the problem with him not knowing... Was we were never on the same page, y'all. Never. Well, we didn't talk. We never, never talked Never communicated anything. all these years. That's Mind what's been you. great about this podcast, actually. It's yeah. It's like, that was kind of the beginning of us really talking to each other about a lot of stuff. Yeah, that was what, that's what I was going to get into. Oh. My bad. Now Spoiler we're Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to give you an idea, ten, last year was our 10-year wedding anniversary today, this year, not today, <laughs> this year is going to be our 11th year decade number two baby so that's a long time to be married to someone and never be on the same page right yeah if you think about it so long yeah yeah that's crazy so when we started the podcast like i i had just like basically like almost hit my breaking point and so i was just like i mean what do i have to lose i'll just fucking like talk about everything oh really is that how you felt when it comes to, like, you and me, I kind of... I felt like we were already doing better by then, by the time we started the podcast. No, sir. Really? No. I feel like the podcast is what made it better. Oh. Don't you... I mean, you don't remember? I, I didn't, I guess. I don't know. I don't that was, think about time. That was the only time, time that, like, we forced to hang out with each other, in a way. Mm-hmm. But when I got pregnant, I got hella clingy, too. Yeah, I feel like that's... I feel like that was good for our relationship. Yes. Which you acting like you needed me for the first time in yeah a decade. Mm-hmm. I feel like I always acted like I needed you, but I needed, but you kept shutting it down all those years. So then, like, I got to the really? point where I feel like I was always complaining about how you acted like you didn't need me before I shut down. Oh, you mean for the first six months of our marriage? <laughs> You're so annoying. Like first three years. Was it that long? Yeah. No. Oh. Anyways. Anyways. So yeah. So. I mean, I feel like I'm right, a whole... You, you look good. Thanks, babe. I feel like I'm a whole different person from when we started this. I feel like our lives are completely our different. Our lives are like, completely our different. Our home life is... Our relationship is so different. Yes. Like, we, we're, like, completely different people. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. But, but in the best way possible, ever, if that makes sense. So much improvement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So much growth. So welcome to the new us. <sighs> yep. Um, so how have we changed? I feel like we should recap that. Well, okay. Asif decided to put everyone second for the most part. So shout outs to him. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to take this moment. Because what the fuck? It took you years. It took you way too long. And it I did, but... I feel like that needs to be emphasized a lot for all the the boys out there what don't let it take that long because most people won't stick around that long and wait for you to get your shit together so in your story you're the hero for sticking around this whole time i am okay i'm just kidding i think (laughs) that's good to know i think it takes two people to stick around though yeah it does take two people to put up with a lot of of shit Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but mm-hmm. that's... And I... That's the purpose of marriage, I feel like. Yes. Right? Like... Yes. Marriage used to... Is supposed to be this, like, sacred institution that bonds people together and, like, for better or for worse, till death do you part. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something you walk away when you get annoyed or when, like, someone has, like, some fucking, you know, things that bug you out or piss you off, like... And then you can just walk away. The whole point of that marriage is so you can't walk away when those things inevitably happen and you inevitably drive each other crazy. You're still stuck with each other, right? Mm -hmm. But now, like, people don't care about marriage like that. Like, for most people, like, religion isn't a big part of their life. And how do you value or determine what is sacred without religion? Mm -hmm. And so if religion... Or if uh, marriage was like a sacred function of religion and religion is what made marriage so important, then when society doesn't care about religion anymore, society also doesn't care about marriage anymore. And now, like, people just walk away, you know? People mm-hmm. get divorced. The divorce rate is like more than 50%, I think. Mm-hmm. My question is, like, why do people still get married at all? If you don't care about, if you don't care about it religiously, mm-hmm. what's the point? Just to, like, throw a party and invite your friends to and, like, blow a hundred grand? Like... A hundred grand? Whose weddings are you watching? <laughs> I don't know. How much do people spend on weddings? I don't, I don't know. know. That's a lot. That's an expensive-ass wedding. Oh, 50. People spend 50, I feel like. Yeah, I guess. That's insane to me. Yeah. And then still get divorced. For the record, Austin's like, a nice if wedding. If I spend a hundred grand on the wedding... I would never get divorced because, like, what, I'm going to waste all that money? Even if I hate you, we're staying together forever for that 100 grand. <laughs> for real? <laughs> oh, my God. I know people that got divorced and had really expensive weddings. Like, really expensive weddings. For the record, Ospenai's wedding was... Low budget. Low budget. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly... We were so young. It was, like, we didn't even start our lives yet. Like, neither of us, like... I think I remember asking your mom. His parents paid for it. God bless them for that mm. um literally paid for every all of it god yeah. bless them for that yeah. um but it was it was like the one of the best weddings i think yeah it was great because we got to choose we had the most amazing food when i tell you the most amazing food i had every like all our favorite stuff we got afghan food moroccan food um American dessert, like, you know, what else? Like, we I don't had know, Jellaby, but people we spend had... all the money on, like, the venue, and then it's just, like, some catered bullshit food. And the venue was the Every best time. part, because it was in Austin's parents' backyard, and if you know them... It was dope. They have the most amazing backyards wherever they live, so it was magical. And it was just, like, our literally our closest friends and family... I'm so glad it was limited in size like that. Yeah. Like if there was like like people were pissed that they weren't invited. Yeah, like and we that's how dope we it was. Easily could have invited twice as many people. You For know sure. What I mean? Easily. Yeah, and we it's not like we didn't know that many people. It was hard. Getting it down to that size. Yeah. Yeah. But. But some of y'all didn't make the cut. <laughs> so sorry. But it was it was a good wedding. Anyways. Anyways, um, so yeah, so we changed a lot. We communicate now. Um, okay, so what was what was the change for you? For input? me, what what was the catalyst for the change? It was when you told your parents that you were just you were. What did you tell them? I don't know. I don't know. You. T- I want to know your side of it. Okay, so my side of it. That's when their Austin's parents had moved. Um. And they needed a lot of help with, like, moving. They needed a lot of help with, like, revamping their new place. Um, and they were just taking Asif every weekend. And Asif and I just, I wasn't getting, like, I wasn't, I needed stuff to be done on the weekend. I needed him, you know, I just, I felt like they had been taking his weekends, even though that might not be really realistic. But to me, it felt like they had been taking his weekends forever. Yeah, you always felt like that. I did. Even when we lived with them, like, yeah. I felt like, like, they took advantage of your, I don't know, willingness to 
be the obedient son Mm -hmm. to like a whole nother level. They like uh, abused that, I feel like. I don't know if they abused it, but I feel like they expected that. And I was yeah. willing to oblige, so why would you not? You Abuse. Know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but they, I, it was too much. I wasn't getting my time. Yeah. And I think you rightfully kind of have always complained about feeling like you came second. A hundred percent. I always came second. I didn't even, I didn't even come second. I came like 10th. I don't think that's accurate, but... The issue is that you weren't first, and and <laughs> the fucked up part was, like, she would complain about that, and I'd be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're not first. And then I'd be, like, wondering why my marriage is fucked up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's because I was, like, completely brainwashed by, like, all this, like, like, I feel like so much of that is just propagated by, like, from the mosque mm-hmm. of, like, um, like, filial piety, like, this idea that you're supposed to be super dedicated to your parents and obedient to your parents like you're supposed to like unquestioningly obey as long as they tell you not to do something like blatantly against your religion like that's the whole thing Mm -hmm. and like they always talk about like all these stories of the prophets and stuff and whatever putting their parents before everything else whatever and so i was like completely i completely bought into it And especially when you become a parent, like, you realize, like, yeah, okay, all the shit they did for you. Mm -hmm. You realize how much, like, really they did. Right. So you kind of buy into it even more. Right. You know? Because also, like, yeah. Because, like... But at a certain point, it becomes... Because, like, that's the family that you come from, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then the family that you're making with your spouse, that's your family that you're making. And that's the family that will propagate into the future with your children. So at some point, if you're like prioritizing your parents ahead of your marriage and your children and whatever, you're prioritizing the past over your future, Mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense to do. Like you can't do that and expect any level of success in the future because you're prioritizing the past. So just from, you know, a logical perspective, like, you have to prioritize what propagates into the future. And for me, it's it's the thing that you always make fun of me for, I guess. You know, the love conquers all type of thing. I don't make fun of it anymore because I I think I I note it. I I realize. I feel like that that's what got us this far. A little bit. Boom, baby. (laughs) I'm still not at your level. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think, you know, I think the love that you find with someone who, like, with your spouse is something that has to be prioritized over everything in life if you want it to be successful. Period. Over literally everything. Mm-hmm. And for forever in our relationship, that wasn't the case for me. You know, I prioritized being obedient to my parents. And then once we had Layla, then, you know, Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, once you have a kid, of course the child is the most important thing. Yeah. I think that's wrong too now. Yeah, he totally did that too. Yeah, and I did. And And so my parents and my children were more important Mm -hmm. to me and more of a priority than you were. And I remember resenting Layla a little bit Mm. because of it. Yeah. Like, that's so bad to say, but, like, that's the honest-to-God truth, like, when she was younger. Well, Cause you would treat all her. of it stemmed from me misprioritizing my life. Mm-hmm. That's what it came from. Mm-hmm. Because now at this point, like, you know, my perspective is on children is, like, I think children are overvalued. <laughs> like, in, in mo- the modern world... There's so much of a focus of, like, your children. Take care of your children. Like, and then you go, like, two generations back. Like, no one was supervising shit. The children were just fucking out playing. And they're, like, come inside when the light gets on or you're going to get beat up. Like, that was how you raised a kid, basically. And now it's, like, these, all these helicopter parents. Oh, these overprotective parents. And they're not. They're, like, smothering the child's development out of caring too much. But I think that's like, did I, I don't know if I talked to you about this before, but you know, like there's the hadith Mm. 
the the prophet said that um, one of the signs of the day of judgment is that the the slave will give birth to her master. Oh yeah, you told you told me, but I still didn't. And no, fine. I don't ever remember hearing what the con- like. What does that mean? I don't like know. that's like most people are like, Allahu alam what it means. Like this is one of the signs. <laughs> but like maybe we should think about it a little bit. You know what I mean? And to me, that's what it means. Like these parents are slaves of their children. Mm-hmm. Their whole life is about like making sure their kids are happy, making sure their kids have this, making sure their kids have that. That's not supposed to be, that's not the proper role. The proper role is not for the parent to be subservient to the child. Mm. That's um, that's the parent becoming a slave to the child. I don't know if foreign parents parent like that, though. I wouldn't say. No, I think I it's mostly like an it's, American thing. Yeah. Like a developed Western society say, thing. That is not how I was raised. <laughs> No, but I think it's very common now for like, yeah, especially the, for like people our age to have kids and stuff. I think that's super common. Really? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's very common for, even like even like, whatever the generation is right underneath us. That's how they were parented by their parents. That's why they have so much entitlement and privilege and hmm. whatever. They don't know how to act. Still, so they look about to be thirty. Oh, what they're, do you... they're in their twenties to thirties mm. and. They act like they should just be able to demand things of the world, and mm-hmm. the world owes it to them or something. Mm-hmm. But I think that's what that is about. Like, there's a, a an inversion of priority with parent and child. And children always used to be an extension of the wealth of the parents, right? Like, mm-hmm. that was part of your, like, property or whatever. And, like, yeah, I have all this property. I have all this cattle. I have, like... 14 children like that's part of your wealth and you you, and the more children that you have the more like it adds to your wealth now it's the opposite (laughs) now it's the opposite they talk about like to raise a child from from birth to 18 costs half a million dollars or whatever it is in america these days Mm -hmm. right so it's an it's a negative financial asset Mm -hmm. a child is i think that's what that you know prophecy or whatever is, is talking about but to me, when I kind of started thinking about all that, that's what made me realize that too. Um, and so the biggest realization was just that uh, the prioritization, the correct prioritization mm-hmm. is you mm-hmm. over everything. And I'd always tell you, like, you change first and you'd be like, no. Yeah, you would always tell me that. You'd be like, no, because I, I feel like you were the problem. I was, I, but I Clearly, didn't know it. yeah. yeah. Because all of that, anyways, yeah, I would tell you to change first and you'd be like, no, it takes two of us to fix this. Mm-hmm. And, and so, <laughs> and honest to God, I was like, now that we've seen the change because I took responsibility for where I was fucking and up. And it was such an and easy you were fix. Completely, it wasn't easy. Maybe it was easy for you. It was not easy for me. Well, I felt like it, it's a, it, I felt like it was very simple what I was asking. Uh, simple and easy are not the same thing. Very simple. It was a very simple fix. It was a very simple fix, yeah. Like, it wasn't like you had to change, like, your whole entire behavior. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. I feel like it was pretty... No. uh, uh, Big shift. Really? Like, you felt like it was hard for you to make that change? I mean, the complete shift of the prioritization of your life sounds like something small to you. I mean, what I... uh, well, That's I think crazy. You're no, crazy. I think <laughs> I think the fact that you shifted was huge from the simple huh? task. From I feel like what I was asking of you was very simple to do, but the the change and the shift that came from that simple task in a way was big. Does that make sense? Yes, but it's just entirely wrong. Well, that's how I feel. I'm glad it was simple for you. Wait, why was it so hard to do? Just because that's what... I mean, reprioritizing your life is not an easy thing to do, I don't think. Like, you're living your entire life with one priority, and then you're like, I'm going to change that. I feel like I don't see... That's a fundamental change. I don't see how that was so difficult. Okay. Anyways, 
It, I mean, I don't. But yeah, see all how that's it could not... that's all it took was for him to. Yeah, so you were right. All I had to do was change first. Yeah, and then the snowball effect. Mm-hmm. And so this is a, a teachable moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's the teaching? I, I feel like we talked about this before. Maybe it was Maybe. in that episode that we never released. Maybe. But it's... The guy is in charge of the relationship. No, we've talked about that before. And and it's the guy's responsibility to set the tone for the relationship. And it's the guy's responsibility. to You need to take responsibility as the guy for whatever the situation is in the relationship. Mm-hmm. But most people want to, like, think of it as this, like, equal thing and then blame each other for each of each other's faults or whatever. But it's not. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's like when you're, like, the leader of a country or you're the president of a company or whatever the buck stops with you the person in charge has to ultimately take responsibility for whatever is going on that they're in charge of even if they directly didn't do whatever happened it's still their responsibility Mm -hmm. so that's what it is i feel like with a relationship too the guy has to ultimately be responsible and take responsibility and it's your problem and it's your responsibility to fix the situation Mm -hmm. and if you want to just shrug off the responsibility and blame her Shit's not going to work out. And that's what you did. Mm-hmm. For a really long time. Yeah. But what did you think my problem was? You're a hoe. <laughs> 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 no. Um. It's really funny because we throw that term around <laughs> so loosely in this house. <laughs> like, it doesn't even mean... It's such a funny insult. It is. I feel like it started with, like, that substitute teacher guy that was, like, whoever threw that paper airplane, your mom's a hoe. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know it was a substitute teacher that started that term. Do you remember that video? Yeah, because I I think it was with Layla or Aisha. I, like, made a video, like, whoever did that, your mom's a hoe. Yeah. And people got upset, right? Probably. Right I don't know. Like, people get upset about everything. Yeah. Give us a shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I, so, I feel like that's what, um, I feel like that's what fixed everything. Yep. It was just prioritizing our relationship over everything else. Literally, he basically told his parents, like, sorry, but I gotta live my life now. <laughs> yeah. When you're, when you're a kid, it's appropriate, okay, for you to listen to your parents about everything. But at some point, you have to grow the fuck up. Mm-hmm. You have to be an adult. Mm-hmm. You have to live your own life. Mm-hmm. Like, most of our, like, think about it. Most of our parents, they're not living their life. Like, the way that it, they raised us mm-hmm. is not exactly the way their parents raised them. Period. Say it louder for the people in the back. So they were willing to go their own way for themselves, but they're not willing to let their children go their own way the same way that, like, what if your parents did the same thing to you when you, when you, like, decided to live your life however you're living it? Literally. Like, as an adult, we each need, we all need to be able to live the way that we choose and the way that we see fit, Mm -hmm. not the way that someone else sees fit for us. Mm -hmm. If you're living the way that, like, based on other people's approval, based on the way that they want you to live, you're not an adult yet. You're not grown up yet. It doesn't matter what age you are. You're like, you could be 40 years old and have, like, five kids. You're still living based on what your parents would approve of or not. You're not a grown up. And I feel like that was my tr- well, part of my transformation, last, like, over the course of the year. Was realizing, like, I don't. Like, I'm not going to feel guilty about it anymore. Yeah. Like, why? Like, I I always felt so guilty about it. And I always felt like I couldn't be authentically me because I was always afraid, like, about, afraid of their judgment. Yeah, you can't. You can't be yourself if you're afraid of judgment. If you're afraid of what other people are going to think of you, that will keep you confined in the box of what those people or what society deems acceptable for you. Or your parents. And that has no necessary relationship with who you really are what the tr- what your true self is and what you're supposed to be doing and what you're supposed to be mm-hmm. so in order to like fit in nicely 
and just follow what's expected of you. You have to sacrifice who your true self is. And that's not something that should be taken lightly. What? And and I think that's what a lot of depression and mental health issues come from. Yeah. It's from people suppressing who they who they really are based on societal or family expectations. Mhm. Family expectations. Because truth is the most powerful thing. And you try to stifle truth. You try to like sacrifice truth for acceptance or for whatever it is. It's not going to end well. But yeah, it's like we get it from society and then like that judgment. And then you get it from your parents. And it's suffocating. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially, I feel like, especially for, like, Muslim kids. I don't know. It's, like, a whole nother level. Yeah. Just from my experience. So, that was definitely part of my, um, I feel like you kind of had that, too. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely part of our transformation in the last year. And I feel like you helped me realize that I just don't. I don't know. Because I feel like I was being suffocated by them, society, and then you, too. No. Sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, but... You're, no, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, like, how do we talk about the part of, like... Like, when it comes to being religious, too, I feel like you've had a huge transformation. You know? Right. Which, by you, whatever, changing that made me feel like I could breathe a little bit again. <laughs> mm-hmm. So how deep you want to go with that? Whatever. I don't care. How deep do you want to go with that? I don't know. You tell me. I think it's fascinating how you think about things now. I mean, I I'm growing de- up, Yeah. I think we both came from a very, like, traditionalist... Mm-hmm. You could call it fundamentalist, like literalist Mm -hmm. interpretation Mm -hmm. of Islam and practice of Islam. Yeah. You know, like what is, if not directly linked, at least, I mean, it's basically almost impossible at this point for anyone who's like super religious within Muslim communities almost around the world to not be, if not directly linked to, then at least influenced by Salafi thought. Mm-hmm. and Salafi interpretation, mm-hmm. right? And so that's what that is. That's that very traditionalist, fundamentalist, literalist view of Islam. And that, I mean, that there's all kinds of, I think, things wrong with that. And I, I don't know what, how deep you want to go into all of those things. Mm-hmm. Well, but, like... but just from a basic world view type of thing Mm -hmm. it is that like cook that that like um what is the right it's like that stereotyped like super religious conservative type of person that takes everything way too seriously Mm -hmm. that judges everybody who might practice or think differently Mm -hmm. It, it and it just it ends up like you the more religious someone is they're not necessarily like a better person they're not a, a better person to be around they're not like necessarily kinder with people they're like harsh and judgmental yeah and like clearly there's something wrong if the more religious you get the more you become an asshole mm-hmm. like there's so, there's something wrong mhm and so for me um one of the biggest kind of points that changed my trajectory was being at the mosque uh i think it was during ramadan Mm -hmm. like a couple years ago Mm -hmm. and i wore some nice sandals to the mosque which is a huge mistake and i'm an idiot i should have known better because i think that was the second time that wasn't that the second time that that um year 
Mm, for me personally, I no. thought it, it was. It happened to me one time. No, I wore some Lacoste slides. Everyone's gonna be Lacoste. like, "Oh, you're nice, Nicole, Lacoste slides," and they were expecting like to keep. You'd probably say like some Gucci slides. Well, I'm not that bougie, guys. Come <laughs> on. To me, they were nice. You guys don't fuck with the crocodile. The problem is they were super comfy. Like it's hard for Austin to like sandals. Okay, like they were super comfy. They looked nice. Okay, I don't. Yeah, they weren't like expensive or something, but they were like. They were nice you compared to them. just like okay. average <laughs> sandals. And I'm going to leave and they're gone. Gone, gone. <laughs> gone, gone. So it's like, oh, let me go check the other entrance. Let me go check by the bathrooms. Nowhere. They're gone. Someone took them and dipped. And so what I'm, I'm supposed to go home without shoes now? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I'm supposed to just like walk, go without shoes. I just came up with a business idea. And the, and the, I went and talked to people, like the official type people at the mosque. And they're like, brother, just take somebody else's shoes and bring it back next time. Oh, I don't remember that. I'm like, that was their response. So they, they're not only not solving the problem that we've created an ecosystem here where it's completely acceptable for a Muslim not to feel safe with their belongings at the mosque around other Muslims. Like we should, we're completely normalizing Muslims stealing from other Muslims in the mosque. That, that we don't find any moral outrage with someone stealing someone's shoes. Not only that, we're, per, we're perpetuating it by telling them to go steal someone else's shoes. <laughs> and I'm like, this, this place isn't what I thought it was, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I should have known because I'll tell you this. The most times that I encounter people being rude, people being disrespectful, people acting like, you know, just completely unacceptably was in the mosque. Mm. In my day-to-day -day life, that's where I encounter that type of bad behavior the most. Mm. And I was like, if this place is really what I thought it was about, it should be the exact opposite. You should see the pinnacle of human behavior and manners and all of that here. But that's not the case. It's the exact opposite case. So I guess this place isn't what I thought it was supposed to be. Hmm. And to me, that was, a big, uh, that was a big turning point. What were you about to say? Nothing. That's what I thought. <laughs> Ew, what? So, I mean, that was a big turning point just as far as, like, the, the way that I thought about what the mosque is and what its purpose is and, mm. you know, so then. Yeah, so then what? Um, you know, for me personally, it was kind of, once you get out of that, then it's like you're no longer bound by the specific way that the people at the mosque are teaching you things. Is and, that where you feel like you learned? Yeah. Mm. For sure. Because mm. I was like one of those people that like... Couldn't miss I Friday. took it seriously. Yeah. yeah. And I went to every Joma and every like new job interview that I went to. I was like, yo, I don't work Fridays. Like straight and up. multiple I like, jobs I didn't get hired because of that. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was... I almost got a job with United. Mm -hmm. And I told them, no, I don't work Fridays. And they're like, oh, we need someone with open availability. Yeah. You know, so I took it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but then once I really kind of distanced myself from that, you know, then I was exposed to thoughts from outside of that strict interpretation of the religion. Mm -hmm. And initially it was, it was especially people like uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, people like that. Mm that really gave me a different perspective on all of that. And then, uh, you know, people like Jordan Peterson uh, and Carl Jung and, you know, people that talk about stuff like that, like people that talk about the symbolic interpretation of religions mm -hmm. as opposed to the literal interpretation. And all of that has made a lot of sense to me, you know, it was like, for example, the story of Abraham, where he's told to sacrifice his son, mm -hmm. you know, 
Like, are, are we supposed to think of it like this is a historical event? There was a guy who was like a prophet and he, has, he had a kid and then God told him, you should kill one of your children for me. Mm. Like, just like, I mean, imagine if, like I told you, God told me I should kill one of my children. Well, you'd think I was fucking insane. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, what? What are you talking about? What kind of, what kind of God is that? Mm-hmm. Do I have you sacrifice your child? Like, literally kill your child. I said, you're going to get, <laughs> this is going to get taken down from YouTube just because of all that. What do you mean? Just saying, that last part. There's no, like, softer way to say that. That sounds very violent. <laughs> but that's the story of Abraham, right? I know, but, he like... He was told to kill his no children. There's no other way to, like... A child, one, one of them. Okay. Right? And then, like, it's a story of, like, obedience that he was willing to do that. Like, doesn't that kind of make you an insane monster that you were willing to do that? Anyways. If you take it literally. Right? But if you take it symbolically, maybe that's not what that story is. Maybe that story is just trying to tell us that for the greatest good, you have to be willing to sacrifice the things that are dearest to you. Mm. Because there's a lesson in that. But if you take it literally, it's kind of a crazy story. (laughs) Yeah. Right? But then he didn't do it. Okay. I know, but like... (laughs) But he was going to. (laughs) Well, yeah, if God told you... That's a crazy thing to tell someone. I know, but it's God. That's crazy. If you actually think about it, it's freaking crazy. But it's God. No comment. (laughs) Are you kidding me? And then, you know, to give you another example, Uh the story of, like, Adam and Eve. Yeah. Like, the story of Eden, right? The Genesis story. So they're, like, chilling up in heaven, Mm -hmm. in this garden. And they were not allowed to eat one fruit, right? And Mm -hmm. then the devil, in the form of a snake, comes to Eve and tells her, if you eat of this fruit, you shall become as a god, knowing right from wrong. She eats it, and she gives some to him, too, and they both eat it, right? And so at that moment is what awakened their conscience to knowing right and wrong, right? Like, that's what makes humans unique is that we have a conscience, we have morality, we have ethics. Animals don't have those things, right? If an animal attacks a human being, it's not because the animal is evil, because it had a moral choice to do right and wrong. It's just doing its nature. Hmm. But human beings are not like that. Human beings aren't just doing their nature. We could choose right from wrong. We have that ability. And so that's what they became aware of that moment that they ate. Right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the evolutionary psychology, human beings literally got their vision from snakes and fruit. Because our visual acuity for color came from uh, from us looking for ripe fruit in the trees. And our visual acuity for emotion came from us looking for predatory snakes slithering on the ground. So literally the way that we see developed from snakes and fruit. But we had that ancient story telling us that we got our vision from snakes and fruit. What does that mean? Uh. (laughs) It doesn't necessarily mean that that literal story was true, but it means there's some kind of deep, mysterious Mm -hmm. truth in there that most of us don't even ever even realize or understand. Right. It's too amazing for us to understand. Mm. And if you take it literally, you cheapen it into a more surface level of understanding. Mm Mm-hmm. To realize that that story is actually true in a way that's deeper than literal truth. Hmm. And that's how you approach everything. 
Yeah, now. that's become my view of everything now. Mm-hmm. Is that like if you take stuff literally, you're cheapening it to a level and you're missing so much. You're missing all the depth. Because I think literally true things are not as true as other things. Like that's an idea I I, I got from Jordan Peterson where he was talking about Sometimes fiction can be more true than fact. Mm. Right? Because if you read a, a non-fiction book, they're just telling you what happened in to this person or in this certain setting or whatever it is. Right? They're telling you a true story of what happened. But if you read a fiction book and people are like, oh, it's not even it's not a true story. Why do I care about it? What do I'm getting out of it? That would be me. A non a, a fiction book has a higher level of truth because in order to, there has to be some kind of truth in there to be able to appeal to people. And the truth that a nonfiction book has to, has to have, or that a fiction book has to have is a higher level because you're, I'm not just telling you what happened. I'm like taking all these like life experience or story or narrative from human life and distilling patterns and distilling characteristics and behaviors and lessons and all of and understanding the situation and then transcribing that all into a made up scenario to present to the audience. So there's a higher level of understanding that is required for fiction than for non for nonfiction there's zero level of understanding necessary. I just give you the facts. But for me to understand and abstract the lessons out of it and then represent it to you in a fictional, completely made up scenario but in a way that the truth of that narrative comes through to you and appeals to wide audiences is a much higher level. And so for that reason, something that didn't literally happen can have more truth than something that never ha- than, than something that is a, just a historical account. Hmm. But there's this, there's this need, I think, for so many religious people to have to make the religious stories historical accounts like to claim that they are historical accounts. And it's, I think, a byproduct of the kind of way that we view history as modern people that didn't used to exist. Like the idea of history as a presentation of historical fact Mm. is a relatively new idea. It started from Ibn Khaldun, who was a Muslim philosopher in Spain, and he came up with that idea. Before that, it was like, there were legends and like these stories and each group would like present their character as the hero. And there was no actual even idea to like, wait a minute, we should just make the most important thing, the facts of what actually happened. It was like, no, let's make this grandiose. Let's build up our guy. Let's villainize the other guys. That's what it always was. But he kind of came up with this idea of like, let's make it just about facts. And now everyone just thinks of it in that context yeah. And I think you lose some things when you just te- think about everything in those type of contexts. Like there's a reason why all of these ancient religious narratives and mythologies and everything appeal to people and have appealed to people and have affected so many people's lives. It's not for nothing. It shouldn't be just thrown out and dismissed. Mm. I don't think it should be taken literally. But it also should not be, to the other extreme, thrown out and dismissed and you throw out the baby with the bathwater. You're going to be missing a lot of stuff. Why does that make you smile? It doesn't. I'm like, what the fuck? You hear violent analogies. What? That's a saying. Ba- throw out the baby with the no, bathwater? No, but I don't like it. <laughs> oh, you don't want to throw babies? No! never heard that saying before by the way throw out the baby with the bathwater never what nope that's a normal like saying whoever made that saying's evil listen all all of like the things of our society i'm and, taking like, it literally it came from like back in the day when the world was crazy but yeah. i don't know what the context is for that actually baby with the bathwater but mm. it's just like <laughs> you don't throw out the good with the bad if you throw away everything you throw out the good with the bad mm. Right? The yeah, bathwater's okay. dirty, you throw out the bathwater. Yeah. You don't throw out the most precious shit with the dirty shit. <laughs> but there's probably like some specific story of where that came from. I don't know 
where it came from. Hmm. I'll, I'll do some research and tell you guys about it next episode. Yeah, and come back to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to me, it was like, you know, so once I kind of went down that road, it was like when you don't take things literally anymore, when you're looking for deeper meaning and truth behind them than just the literal interpretation, then you can't take any of it literally. And you can't, and you're not necessarily like bound by all the conclusions and rules and whatever that is derived from literal interpretations anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that leaves you, but it leaves you outside of the box. Very so that's where I am right box. now. I'm just <laughs> floating around outside the box. I'm still in the box, sort of. Floating. How's it feeling there? Bouncing off the walls How in the box. How you doing in there? I'm trying to get to Asif's level. Not there yet. Why do you think I'm not there yet? I, I mean, why did it take me 10 years to realize you're important? Ew. <laughs> I'm just saying, everyone has their own, like, timeline, you know? Yeah, but it's hard for me to think, like, oh my... It, yeah, because, like, the way you've um, changed and how you don't take everything so literally... I was taught to take everything so literally. So was I. I know, but like I, I, like I can't even, like I'm like, every time you tell me that, you know now, yeah. I'm like, how did you even get there? <laughs> like, I don't even. Yeah, if that's the way you've been, if yeah. that's the only way you've been taught to think, then it's hard to think any other way. Yeah. It so really is. That's where I'm, I'm bouncing but off the wall. That kind of goes along with what we were talking about earlier about schooling and stuff, you know? Yeah. Like the school system is designed to teach you what to think, not mm -hmm. how to think. Right. Because, and that's the same thing with like the public school system and it's um, designed to just funnel people for the benefit of corporations and mm -hmm. the control of the government. And it's the same thing for religious schooling and teaching that designs mm -hmm. people to like, you know, stay in the box and shut up and don't think outside these bounds and don't do things outside these. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's about control. Yeah. It's about the people in charge, the people that are in power. If individuals decide to not stay in the box, if people go outside of this system of control, if people are true to themselves and become real individuals instead of, you know, acquiescing to what's expected of them or demanded of them of society. Mm -hmm. That is by definition a threat to that system. It's a threat to the stability of that system. And that's obviously in the disinterest of the people that are in power of the system. So the people that are in charge and in power, they're empowered by the system. Their incentive is to keep the system functioning mm -hmm. the way that it is because they're at the top of it. So they want everyone to stay in this box and be educated about this and think this way about things. And if you start thinking for yourself, it's radically destabilizing, which is bad for the people that are at the top of the hierarchy because now they can fall and someone else can take their place. And it's so obvious because you'll notice in the comments after we post this, th those same reactions. Like people freak the fuck out when you start going outside the box. Yeah. It's a, it's like people a want system you to stay of regulation of self-censorship and all that. Like people will self-censor themselves just so they don't get that whiplash, that backlash. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the genius of these types of self-perpetuating systems is that once it's indoctrinated enough, they don't need to do anything to keep us in that box. We keep each other in the box. Genius. It's the crabs in the barrel. Right? One crab is trying to crawl out and he would make it out, but then the other crabs that are at the bottom of the barrel grab him and pull him back down. So they all stay in. None of them can escape because they will all pull I didn't each know other that. back down. Yeah. They do that by yeah. nature? Yeah. Everybody so do does human that. beings. Yeah. For real. That's what the comment section is for. <laughs> you little crabs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we need to make merch that's just like, is there a crab emoji? Yes! There's a crab emoji. We need to just make a shirt with just a crab emoji. <laughs> oh, that's funny. A bunch of hoes. <laughs> no, crabs. Crab hoes. <laughs> Can they wear fishnets? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. So, yeah. So, yeah. What else? What else you got for us now? Mm, I feel like I have a bunch of stuff. Let's see. I looked at my notes. Yeah, come up with some... Uh, I mean, we've been going at subjects. it for a kind of a while. Yeah, I know. But if you got more subjects and we're here, the people have been waiting now. Mm. Been waiting. Oh, um, I feel like, I feel like, um, just a touch, it kind of went hand in hand with the last subject we were on, but remember how we were driving up to the mountains to go see your parents? And I don't know how we came across, I don't know how we could, like, start talking about this, but we were talking about, like, death, right? Mm-hmm. And how you're just, like, not afraid to die at all. I, w- I want to convince myself of that. Like, oh. at an intellectual level, I'm not, because I've built enough conception to, to make myself okay with it. But I think at a physical level, uh-huh. there's just, like, the instinct of any living creature that is just, right, like, like, it tries to survive. Right. You know? But I thought it was very interesting, your, um, your, your, what do you call it? Conception? I guess, sure. On of why death? that, yeah, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I, do you remember what we were saying? No, but I remember what you said. Said, what was I saying? Like how Tell the, me and then I'll try to explain it. it. Aren't, it's in, it sh- like, souls aren't, like, it's an illusion that... Yeah. Whatever, so go... I don't explain it like you do, obviously. I mean... Okay, let me think of where do I start with this. Right. I don't remember. Like, everyone's afraid... Like, people don't want to leave this life. They're too attached to this life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake, and it's based on an illusion, and it's based on this idea that, like, this life is what's important, or this life is what's real. Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly the opposite. Like, this life, I think, is some kind of temporary... Which we're taught that in a snap. Illusion. Yeah, but you don't take it seriously. you like, what does right. that mean? The, the way you took it, I was to like... take it seriously? You know what I mean? Yeah, because that's what I'm always... I'm always taking it seriously like that. Like, well, literally. it's so easy to do because the whole world is designed to make you take it seriously. Right, and I thought when you, ta- when you said that, I was like, what? Like, well, like I, I had like a... Wait, what? Like, I had to... Re- I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. Because, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, it's just like a whole nother level of thought. But I'm just not there yet. <laughs> so, yeah, I th- I think, espe- like, it's especially bad in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like you were just saying. Like, it's hard to think outside of the bounds of everything that you've been taught how to think about something. Mm-hmm. And so I think for a lot of us, it's hard to ever think outside of the context of a modern person in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Like most of the way that people operate their thoughts now is based on like scientific materialism and the ability to like prove facts with evidence and all that stuff. People didn't used to think like that for most of human history until like, you know, like maybe a hundred years ago or something. That was not the way most people thought about stuff. Mm. But I think the fact that most people think that way now, it serves to 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 just keep people boxed in in that material way of thinking, of thinking about this world and this life. When, you know, I think the way the subject came up was I think we were talking about your grandfather. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe I think you're right. And for me, you know, thinking about that, like trying to put myself in that position of being like really old. Oh, yeah. And like, you know. So my grandpa's like 92, mashallah. And there was a scare. (laughs) Everyone thought he was like dying. And and then everybody wanted to go see him, right? Because they thought he was dying. Turns out, 
he wasn't dying. I don't. And, and he didn't want to see anybody. And he didn't want to see anyone. <laughs> He's just like, guys, just leave me alone. Let me Literally. die. Literally. And Asif was just like, yeah, leave him alone. Like, Yeah, why are you guys bothering him? Because that's what I realized. Like, when people, like, when someone dies, it's not about them. It's all the people that they left in this world that are all upset about it. Like, how are you guys making it about you? It's not about you. This person just left. It's their life. Right? It's their death. But all the family is making it about them. Like, oh, now uh, us, we're going to miss him. Like, What do you mean, duh? I know, that's what you always tell me, but, like, apparently you're on that, and I didn't know. Like, I don't think most people think of it that way. What? What I just said. Like, I don't think most people are realizing that they're making it about themselves instead of the person who actually died. Well, think of it. What if it was, like, your kid, though? You know what I mean? It's still losing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then just you're recognize just... that you're just feeling sorry for yourself, mostly. Yeah, but right? that is so, after reading that article that I read, the world's saddest story. Okay, maybe not the world's, but it was like, I like felt, y'all. Anyways, we need to finish here. It was the story of some lady who like everyone died, like all of her family died. Right? Is that what you're talking about? It felt like that. And she just had cancer like a few times. Mm. And like, it was just everything that could possibly have gone wrong in this lady's life went wrong. Like... I've, I never thought that reading something could make me feel so like, like I couldn't breathe. Like if I felt like I couldn't breathe. Imagine experiencing that. Yeah. And she came out of it still so, so much faith, you know? Yeah. I'm going to start crying thinking about it. Uh-huh. See, Nora swore that this was going to be the first podcast she didn't cry <laughs> in. And I was like, bullshit. That shit hit me. That shit hit me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways. Finish. Oh, you really are going to cry. Yeah. For a little now. I don't want to think about it. I'm so sad. But yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about with death was just that, like, everything in this world is designed to make you be attached to this world and to fear losing this world and to just think about this world. But if this world is just... The same thing that like all the traditional religions tell us, the same thing that simulation theory tells us, like this life is an illusion. This is not the real thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is like you, you fell asleep and you had a crazy dream. That's what this life is. You can be attached to that. Imagine like, like imagine you went like, that's why simulation theory is such a great analogy. Imagine you went into some simulation, some video game. And everything in the video game was so good and so convincing and so real that you forgot that you were in a fucking video game. And, and then you don't want to leave the video game. And it's like, bro, real life is outside. What are you, why are you still in there? You're spending all of your day in this stupid video game when real life is out there. And people get so swept up in it that they don't even realize they're spending, they're spending their whole day in this video game and neglecting their real life. And it's the same thing with your life and then the spiritual world that happens outside of this world. Can like I... you got too stuck up in this shit and you thought this was the real thing. What? Remember how I said I was going down a rabbit hole last night? This was one of the rabbit holes. It wasn't a simulation. He was talking about why... Social media is so bad and why it's, it's, it's like, like he didn't say it was like devilish or whatever, but like how he was talking about it. Like, that's all I could think about, like how mm. evil social media is. And it was because you never want to, they're making it. Leave. So you it's never want to. It's engineered to make you stay there. Yeah. So you never want to leave. So then you think. That's and, the video game. Like, and that's what this life is. This life is engineered to make you want to stay here, even though the better shit is outside of it. And so people cling on to this life and they want to have all these medical interventions and they want to, uh, death is the worst thing that can happen to you and you want to avoid that at all costs. You'll do anything. You'll spend all the money you worked your whole life to make just to give yourself a few more days. And it's like, you're no, you're getting tricked by the system. That shit was designed to make you want to stay here and you really want to stay here. Let me see if I and, can find it. And what's outside of it, on the other side, if you weren't fucking up in this life, is going to be better. So don't fear it. Um, but, but Have you ever watched Ready Player One? That's like... Yeah, the, that movie's crazy. 
I love that movie, but it's like, it, like that's, that's what the I future. That's yeah, what that's what I visualize every time I read about something like that. Yeah, it's a good movie. If you guys haven't seen it, you should it watch it. It is really good. I thought. Nora, like, Nora does not like sci-fi movies. I either. do not. And so there was some video game sci-fi movie, and she's telling like, me it's cool, and I'm like, "What it. is happening?" But yeah, it's dope. Let me see. So yeah. Damn. What was I gonna say? I was. I I'm had sorry. some other point I was gonna. I make. know. I'm sorry. I'm really. No, good. that's okay. But, um, I was going somewhere. Ah, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, that's what i was gonna say you were saying like i'm not saying that social media is devilish or something yeah i think it is i think all technology is the amish were fucking right like the amish are <laughs> right we would all like they're the ones who like don't live with modern technology like they drive horses horse buggies instead of cars they don't have electricity they like cut all their wood with hand saws and shit i think they're right i think all of modern technology is designed to capture us within that system that system that controls us and tells us how and what to think and to make us like clutch onto this illusion of a world. Mm. It's all, it's like, it's designed to capture everything about you and just keep you right here where it wants it, where it can make money off of you. And then you get like addicted to it and, and plugged into it and you can never unplug. Hmm. And I, I don't know. I I feel like like everyone talks about like with uh, Steven Pinker and all that stuff is like Who's that? he's like some kind of I don't know some kind of scientist or some shit but he wrote this book about like how the world is better than it's ever been you know people get all this negative uh, yeah you of, always say that people get a negative vibe from all the news and everything because if it bleeds it leads and people get ratings off of showing you horrible shit and it's just fear porn but and so people have a negative perception of the world like thinking it's all going to shit but his point was like statistically in every way possible it's not getting worse it's getting better everything is getting better the likelihood that you'll starve to death is lower now the likelihood that your children will die in infancy is lower the likelihood that you'll like be a victim of violent crime is lower. The likelihood that you'll die of a horrible disease is lower. The, the violent sat- crime the- part does not feel lower though. <laughs> because of the news. Yeah, I guess. Imagine, well, imagine if you never listened to the news. Okay. How, would you feel that same way? How many people do you know that have been mugged? I guess. If it was just word of mouth or with, mm. from people around you. I don't know. That would be non-existent. Mm. Same thing with a lot of other things that people live in fear of kidnapping and shit like kidnapping is down do you know that is the it? rate of kidnapping is down mm-hmm. for over the last like 40 40 years from back when people used to let, let their kids just play outside all day unsupervised till now where no one does that ever mm-hmm. but you think it'd be more likely now you know what i mean why? like that's why people are responding to that because they don't want their kids kidnapped we yeah. gotta watch them but it's like they're less likely to be kidnapped Mm-hmm. We should be letting them have more freedom and more unsupervised time outside, mm-hmm. according to the, to, to the statistics. I look bald. You do look bald. <laughs> I feel like you could look good. No, I try to filter. I do. If we, I, man, I really wish we knew how to green screen stuff. Well, I know I would. That's it's easy. You just put a green thing in the back. No, and but you could do it with blue also. What? So we could blue screen out. Let's look. Your whole body and your head. <laughs> and you'd just be a floating head. <laughs> okay, I don't know. You might look crazy. I'm not sure. I think I would look crazy. <laughs> I don't know how many times I have to tell you. Look. But it's I covering feel... my hairline. Anyways. I don't know. I feel like I could. Oh, you could like that? I you could have like... a fetish for that? <laughs> you freak. There's only one way to find out. Oh, my God. Okay, but this is what I was saying. Like, all the statistics are up as far as, like, standard of living, Mm -hmm. all that shit. Like, if you look at, like, before COVID, ooh, really? On the air? It's dead. You're going to be dead smoking that shit. It's not anything. (laughs) It's just air. (laughs) I heard a crackling. Yeah, it's because it's empty. And dead. Anyways. Sorry. The UN projected, based on current statistics, this is pre-COVID, 
that we would completely eliminate abject poverty from the face of the earth by 2030. Oh, I think, think I remember you telling me that. So think about that. That's that's insane. How that's the most like hopeful shit you could think of. But they don't tell us that. But they don't tell you that. But my point is despite all of the improvement and everything, there's something that we lost on the way. Hmm. There's something that we lost that the people back in that world that was more full of suffering they had it and we lost it with all of our modern world and our convenience and our Mm. you know modern medicine and standard of living it's the same shit that you see like you know when you i mean i don't know how you feel you tell me but when i went to morocco with you yeah like that was some of the places we stayed in you're like oh this is the third world yeah right like these people are like like god knows what their like you know cost of living per day is but it's like you guys don't have running water yeah but i don't know that that necessarily means like i'm more satisfied with my life because i live in some place that has running water than these people i think it's the other way around why because i think when you have all that convenience and ease, mm-hmm. you focus on the wrong things. Mm-hmm. And you don't have, and we talked about this before how depression is a disease of the rich. Mm-hmm. You're going to suffer in other ways that you're not like programmed to evolutionarily. Evolutionarily, we're programmed to survive through rough shit, through like not having a lot, through mm-hmm. like, you know, poverty, through like all that stuff. We're adapted to that. We've been doing that since the dawn of time. We have not, we're not adapted to like dealing with mental health because we have everything that we could ever want and we're still unhappy. Mm. Something is lost on the way and all the measurable ways that you can mark how it's becoming better, I don't know if the cost is worth it. Hmm. That's how, that's another way I've changed this year. What? Not this year, within the last year. Is I learned to appreciate, I get, I like, I don't know. I feel like, sh- like after having Shaithi, like, there was a whole new wave of like beauty to me, you know? Of you physically, you mean? No. Are you feeling yourself now? Absolutely not. Okay, you're looking no. good. No. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Psycho. Of like him, like like human life, like, you know? Mm. Like, like after we had him, I felt like I didn't need anything else. Mm. You know? Yeah. I literally, I never thought I could feel that content with everything. Yeah. I like felt. You remember? Do you, know you remember why you me? think that? You know why I think that is? Why? Like we've fulfilled our genetic like uh, <laughs> requirement to the world <laughs> because we are two and we've created two of us to go along in the future and mm. and f- take our spots and propagate into the future. So that fulfills you in a way. I felt fulfilled. That I I don't think zero kids you can never feel that. One kid you can't feel that either. That's not to take anything away from right. Layla or something. But if you're two and then you die and you leave behind one, you're still leaving behind a genetic depletion mm-hmm. of your genetics. If you do two, it's at least a a, a clean transfer into the future. I don't know, but. I'm- that's a really... That's why you have to have a minimum of two children. This is my new rule. I just made it up right now. <laughs> but in, in, order, in order to be properly fulfilled in life, you have to have a minimum of two children. And I, probably the more you have, the more fulfilled you are. There might be some diminishing returns at some point. It seems like my mom feels like that. And I'm always like, I don't get how. But now you should, right? Since having Shaithi. To an extent, to an extent. 
I feel like maybe not when it's your after, entire life. When you life. have one, you're like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. With two, you're like, oh, wow, I didn't even know it could be more amazing. Yes. With three, you're like, okay, great. With four, you're like, all right, this is getting too much. Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> probably like, gonna get old at some point I don't, right? you would I think. don't know or maybe it just keeps getting better every time I always say yeah that's how my mom describes it that like, it gets better every time yeah maybe she's right how would, and she how says would we it know? gets easier too I think that's probably true and I'm just like oh my honestly y'all I think she's right she might I mean no it, she's definitely maybe right it's but like I just, th- it's like the like when you talk to someone who doesn't have any kids yeah. and you try to explain to them what it yeah. is they can never get it yeah and maybe it's the same thing for someone with six kids talking to us yeah we'll never get it i don't even want it honestly i don't want to get it well, that's what people with no kids say period i, don't I get want it. it i get you now okay yeah i get it anyways was that shather yes it was it's been real <laughs> Um, there were so many other things we were supposed to talk about. Like what? Time. It's we've been you on had a whole for... list, right? I had a list. We'll talk about it next time. Great to see you guys. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. We're out. There's a baby crying. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to share, um, like and subscribe. Uh, don't forget to send us a voice memo message. Oh yeah, we did. How do have any you guys been? Memos. I will have the link down below for the um. Do we have some that we can I don't do? know. We don't have time for that. Shady's crying. Maybe we got to restart. No. With the voice memos, I mean. Or should we next episode read old <sighs> ones from a year ago? I don't know if we have any, though. I don't... Okay, send them in, you but, crabs. Even if it's just like an angry message. Like, maybe it'll be therapy for you. I don't know. Um. Okay, good talk. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Bye. <laughs> Links down below. That's what you get. It was a joke. Goodbye.